Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Kegro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Uh, it is Monday, May 28th, 2018. It's Memorial Day. And uh, my microphone paused to remember all those who gave their lives in service to their country and some of those who give their lives for something else. We just want to remember everybody who we can. Uh, yeah, we just had a uh, very interesting chat with the kids as I sent them out the door on their way to the local Memorial Day ceremony for uh, or in, in service to their scout organization. They uh, take care of the local memorial <clears throat> and set up a uh, Memorial Day service. And they're, so they're on their way out to set up chairs and uh, water stations and shade stations and everything. But it's actually going to be pretty cool in the neighborhood. So that's nice so that everyone gets away with a little bit of a break and uh, do a flag ceremony and they play some music. It's a very nice outing and uh, just sort of uh, reminding them of everything that they're there to do. And in fact, uh, I did see some so some very interesting discussion of Memorial Day and its meaning out there on Twitter. And, you know, there's ordinarily lots of stuff out there, but uh, some stuff struck us today. So we had a very interesting chat, including uh, reminding them that, of course, to uh, respect everybody who uh, shows up for the ceremony today, <clears throat> which as a matter of course ought to be done anyway, as they are scouts but reminding them why everybody is there and who these people are and the fact that, uh, of course, they'll be taking everything that goes on there quite seriously today. And sometimes you have to remind the scouts, yeah, uh, you got to watch yourself in terms of uh, fooling around today, even if it's just you and a friend uh, kidding with one another. If it's happening during the ceremony, you're likely to get dirty looks, and here's why. And it was kind of interesting uh, both to see what uh, their reactions were and my own. So uh, they're on their way out to take care of our Memorial Day obligations, whereas I am here taking care of my Memorial Day obligations, bringing you a live show on this holiday weekend. And uh, well, I, I didn't think I was uh, didn't think I was going to get around to doing it, but I realized uh, I have just too much on my plate to prepare something for a pre-taped show. Plus, of course, Greg Dworkin gets antsy when he doesn't get his chance to get on the air and share stories with you. So I'm looking forward to it today. And I, of course, only have to do uh, about half the work today when Greg shows up. It's always interesting to uh, see, A, what's going to be on his plate, and B, uh, what can I get to eat while he's chatting us up? Okay, plenty to get to. Not a super exciting weekend in terms of total mania from Donald Trump. And it's getting boring, I guess. I'm tired of his show already. And uh, he did, of course, spend the weekend whining. I think he made it to the golf course uh, on Sunday, perhaps. And uh, well, congratulations to him. I realize today we're in now week 71 of the presidential apprentice. And of course, yeah, there's been 71 weekends in his presidency. Maybe I guess it might be 72, given when the uh, inauguration fell. But I'm not positive about that. And he's been to the golf course. What is it? What are we on? Like 120 something times now. And he doesn't always wait for the weekends to go, of course. But uh, just thought we'd keep up with the count and remind you. Yeah, it, it hasn't even been a hundred weeks yet, and it's some time until we'll see that. Uh, Threshold crossed. Uh, things to catch up on, though, uh, besides his rage tweeting and rage whining tweeting. Lots of interesting stories. As a matter of fact, here comes Greg Dworkin to fill us in on most of them. And some follow up on what ended up becoming the big story of the weekend, the one that most people spent time thinking slash chatting about. The missing kids story, the 1,500 missing migrant children story, which, uh, te well, it blew up and with good reason. Everyone was fairly outraged. And so there's been some explanation slash pushback on the uh, genesis of the story, the facts behind the story, and the uh, very many other subplots behind the story. I don't know that I, dis that I agree with all of them, but we'll see if we can sort through at least some of them so that you're aware 
Because it'll be as much talked about, as I think, as, well, actually, probably not, about as the stories themselves. You know how these things go. The sensational part of it will be remembered, and the nuance of it, not so much. Although, quite honestly, I'm not that worried about the fact that the Trump administration could have a terrible story on its hands that isn't 100% correct, but that everybody is outraged about anyway. We'll do our part to straighten it out, but it doesn't bother me a great deal that uh, the Trump administration will be digging out from underneath a heap of flaming garbage. Uh, But let's get to the stories that are actually true. Greg Dworkin has a number of them, and uh, let's share them now. Good morning, Greg. Happy Memorial Day. Hey, good morning. Happy Happy Memorial Day to you, too. Uh, I'll take this... uh show very very seriously yes there you go and uh by the way while you call I'm, me, sir? Uh, rounding up the stories don't forget you can line up some pop tarts and just toss them in the toaster and you're good to go yes right uh but you should see the, the pop tarts we have in this house now uh, pop tarts have gone completely crazy since the good old days when they were filled with fruit maybe or yeah. something like it uh so now it's just like well we ground up cookies and put them in the middle of this cookie oh uh oh, really? well all right i mean I would like a little strawberry. That that tastes nice. Well, you're having s'mores or cookies and cream. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know why I'm complaining. The old Pop Tarts weren't that great, but I don't know. Well, I'm, you know, there's there's yeah, a solution yeah, for all of this. Of course, you do the shopping, and then you know you don't have this issue, right? Yeah, you know what I do, and I still have. <laughs> this is what you have to buy for the kids, and I don't think to. Well, if you would like a blueberry Pop Tart, then buy it. Well, I'm not wasting money on a blueberry pop tart, and it's my, I drop my cane, and the whole thing goes downhill yeah, from there. Get off my lawn! Right. All right. So uh, we have some some big themes here. I think what I'll do is, uh, you know, door number one is like uh, ask the liar in the White House. Yeah, that guy. Door number two is where are the children, and door number three is politics and polling, including uh, the California primary coming uh-huh. up. So I think I'm going to start with being a liar because I think it's important to try to figure out what's going on with the kids. All right. But you first have to start with, well, what do you do when you don't believe a single thing that the White House tells you? Yeah, that's well, that makes it troubling and and a little easier to do something like, you murdered all those kids. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Well, it feels like you did. He didn't murder them. And I don't think he sold them to uh, human traffickers. I don't think he sold any of them. True, that's, and he's, that's, and that's he's upset out there about too, that. And I don't think that that's true. The problem is, of course, separating the kids in the first place, which is horrible and something that Trump does as policy. Yes. Well, that's, yeah, that's something he needs to own up to. And, but uh, but how can you own up to it? Um, uh, well, let let me ask you a simple question. Where's Melania? I sold her. Nobody's seen her I in guess. like two weeks. How do you know he didn't? I don't. How do you know they're not separated? I don't. And and if he said they How weren't, you know I would know even less. Barron and just go back to New York City and say, stop calling me. I don't know that. As a matter of fact, somebody did point out the, her her Twitter location has changed to back to New York City. I guess it was <laughs> D.C. for a while. And I don't know that that's the case. I never checked. But it, it's New York City now, which it shouldn't uh, be. You no, know, it, it just be irresponsible not to speculate. Uh, right. Daniel Dale, uh, uh, yes. Toronto. Uh, Ex, uh, excellent, excellent. Yes, uh, best reporter, reporter in America, and he is in America, even though he's Canadian. We yeah. have him here, and we're not letting him back. Uh, so uh, he, yeah, was uh, he's uh, a Washington correspondent for the Toronto Star. Right, can't have him back. And one of the things he did during the primaries is go to Trump rallies I'm and make a habit of listing falsehoods, lies. And uh, other things that simply weren't true that he said, you know, he said eight lies today or eight things that weren't true today, depending upon circumstance. Yes. Uh, he's bad. Now, the, the genesis of this recent discussion. Are good. Yes. That has to Trump's do bad. with the fact that um, there was a off the record briefing given for White House ah, reporters. Yes, that was a huge deal this weekend. Thank you. And it was given by, I guess, a, a fellow named Mark Pottinger. I talked a little bit about where we're at with the Korea situation. And so reporters, including the New York Times, reported on this particular background briefing, mm-hmm. as they often do. Trump started tweeting, the New York Times is lying. They don't know what they're talking about. 
and they made up this person and they made up this whole story. Yes, this White House official, quote unquote, White House official, doesn't even exist. It doesn't even exist. The, the problem, of course, is, Lordy, there are tapes. Yes. And so there are exists. tapes of this guy and the reporters who were there. Uh, some of them gave the story to people who weren't there. And the people who weren't there said, I wasn't there, so I'm not under obligation to not report the name. The guy's name is Mark Pottinger. It happened. This is what happened. Uh, you know, uh, Yashir Ali, for example, uh, did a nice uh, tweet storm on that. Yes. Exactly who it is and why he was reporting it. And a lot of other reporters were kind of in the same boat. I have some, some of them in the pundit round, roundup. Okay, let's take a look. Bless you. <clears throat> it's a rough morning for all of us. I keep clearing my yeah. throat. And... Uh, you know, for example, um, let's see, uh, we have uh, somewhere here, we have uh, uh, reliable sources. President Trump is a leader of the United States. He's also a liar. This has been well documented. Lying was a big part of his business strategy. Now, as commander in chief, he misleads the public constantly. And that was Brian Stel Stelter hmm. on reliable sources on CNN Sunday. Clyde Haberman, uh, who's Maggie's father, but a retired New York Times reporter himself. Why I've you? been a professional journalist for more than 50 years. In my view, Trump, with his mendacious tweet, violated the underlying agreement of that background brief ring, and so all bets are off. I say the name of the briefer he claims doesn't exist, and, and that name was out there. Andrew Feinberg, am I the only White House reporter who feels we shouldn't have to abide by their insistence on speaking on background if the president is just going to use that to attack and defame us? I'm seriously considering just tweeting that senior official name and so they did yes and then daniel dale was on the show and said uh incessant dishonesty is the central feature of the presidency but it's too often treated as a sideshow rather than the show hmm. rather than the central story so maggie haberman was then tweeting about well how difficult it is for newspapers and reporters to figure out the intent and therefore when it's a falsehood when it's a lie so on and so forth it all becomes uh very very difficult uh the hill which is no uh groundbreaker in terms of uh, uh reporting complexities or or uh, standards but it's a pretty good uh thumb in to the wind idea of where the wind is blowing okay the hill has said said audio discredits trump's claim that white house <laughs> official doesn't exist Okay. Journalist Yashir Ali, who posted the audio to Twitter, identified the source as National Security Council official Matt Pottinger, not Mark, Matt Pottinger. In the clip, Deputy Press Secretary Rod Shah introduces Pottinger at an on-background meeting and asks reporters to refer to Pottinger as a senior White House official. In a barrage of tweets Saturday morning, Trump attacked the article for suggesting disagreements within the administration on a diplomatic strategy for North Korea and admonished the Times to use real people, not phony sources. So that's where the genesis uh, to all of this comes from. And uh, Maggie says, you don't always know what he's thinking, so you can't just say lie all the time. Sometimes, but we've documented all these times in the New York Times about all the times that he said falsehoods and people are venting their frustration on Maggie saying that's not good enough. You have to call it a lie when he's lying. And if, if you don't, then people don't know that he's lying. So Daniel Dale uh, has this really, really nice uh, thread where he explains a lot of this. And he says, uh, I'm someone who uses lie a lot for Trump claims. I also think Maggie's points in this fight are indisputably true. Two things are true at once. One, Trump is a serial liar. Two, reporters can't call all his false claims lies. Sometimes he's confused or ignorant, not intentional. Uh, that happens. Exact tweet was, I've written stories about his lies, falsehood, whoppers, half-true, salesman-like stretches. The reality is... What he does can be hard to label because as anybody who has worked for him will tell you in candor, he often thinks whatever he says is what's real. Yes. So somebody tweeted. This is like, I think it was Seth Maskett, but it could have been somebody else. Seth Maskett's a political scientist. He said, having Trump in the White House is like having, you know, a, a George Costanza in the White House without inhibitions. Uh, you know, the guy from uh, Steinfeld. Yeah, well, uh, if, it's not a lie if you I, believe it, Jerry. <laughs> Still an understatement, but yes. Uh, and although, I mean, I don't know why even, like, I, I'm not going to have a fight with Maggie Haberman. She's not going to notice me anyway, but so I guess I can well, do I anything I want. I don't think having a fight. I, I think she's basically right about it. But what Dale yeah. does not to say, it's important. He says, I, I think basically all big hmm. U.S. papers 
are too cautious in using lie with Trump. It's warranted in many cases in that they devote too little coverage to the lies. That yes. doesn't mean they shouldn't call every false claim a lie. When Trump makes up a fictional phone call from the head of the Boy Scouts, there's no word for that but lie. When yes. Trump is wrong about policy, he's often lying, but other times he seems ill-informed. Yes. The term is not the central issue, in my view, in Daniel Dale's view, which I happen to agree with. What's most important is consistent coverage of the dishonesty, consistently treating it as a major story, consistently calling it out in basic news coverage rather than leaving it to fact checkers. That's what's too often missing. I'll just interject right. here as an example of his own coverage. He would go to a Trump rally and say, Trump said this, the base loved it. He told 18 falsehoods. Yes. OK. I mean, the idea that you would cover a Trump speech. In the media, just step back and look at the big picture where he's lying, let's say, about the kids who are missing and he's lying about MS-13 and he's lying about what his policies are and he's lying about five other things and he's lying about what other people told him from other countries and he's lying about the reaction yes. and says, but, you know, the main thing here is, folks, we got to do something, got to build this wall, we, we got to stop these gangs. And then the headline the next day in the paper, Trump slams MS-13. Trump uh, attacks uh, 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 illegal immigrant policy. You know, well, right. but, but they skip all the facts that he got wrong. They don't even put that in the story. And it's all that they make a coherent narrative of Trump's rambling speech in order to deliver to the readers the essence of what they thought Trump was trying to say. Yes. And that's mm. what they get wrong. What they uh, could say yeah. that he delivered well. an ill-informed rant and among the things that he said were untrue were not these nine things. But in the process, he also said this. Uh, that would be yes. far more to the point and would get to the idea that he rambles. He doesn't always know what he's talking about and he doesn't get it right. They leave that stuff out of the story. And that's what's so exasperating. Mm. Yes. OK. I'll agree there. So uh, back to Daniel Dale, the term is not the central issue in my view. It's most important is consistent coverage of the dishonesty. I understand the frustration of the liberals who yell at me, call them lies, capital letters. That means you're not using your inside voice. But if we're going to hold ourselves out as arbiters of truth, we have to stick with what we know is true. In conclusion, here is my list of the fifteen hundred and ninety one false claims Trump has made as president. Okay. Remember, he's got to keep the list. I agree. Uh, you know, there's there's people who keep lists. He's one of them. Yeah. I agree that false claims that come from ignorance are bad. I don't see false claims as an exculpatory phrase. Ah. It's bad. The president lies so often. It's bad. The president so often doesn't know what he's talking about. In this case, with the claim about the New York Times, I use lie, ridiculous lie. I understand the argument. We don't know for sure if he was just unaware of his own staff's briefing. But still, it's subjective. One more. I think the biggest issue with coverage of Trump's dishonesty is that it usually doesn't happen at all. Even if, and this is where he's getting to yes. the same thing I was saying. Even if he's called falsehoods or whatever, the biggest lies are noted in some way. But I can't even tell you the number of times I've covered a rally where Trump has said more than 15 false things and read stories in the rally. It doesn't want, once mention this incessant dishonesty. It's Trump talks up tax plan. Trump attacks such and such. So I know there can be more than one problem at once. But I think what's clearly the biggest issue is not coverage terminology, but coverage frequency and intensity. The continued treatment of Trump's dishonesty is something other than a central daily story of this presidency. We mm -hmm. can't get worn down by Trump's relentlessness with lying, treating false claims as worth mentioning the first time, but not the 32nd time. We have to match his energy and consistency and challenge every time I say the end for now. And that's the way his reporting goes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good. Yes. I think I, I think it's one of the best jobs anybody's doing on the Trump administration anywhere. Right. And then he gives another example from a couple of days ago. Why? Right? That, he says a consistent thing that happens when you fact check Trump is that ah. some of Trump's defenders dismiss the lie by pointing to some underlying truth that Trump didn't say and accusing you of ignoring it. Yes, I did see right? this one. Trump says reporters made up a person who doesn't exist. You note the person exists. And the defenders say he's saying the Times misquoted the person. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> right. But he meant that. He's so befuddled <laughs> and idiotic that he so said something else. Not only else. his defenders, 
but the newspapers yeah. do the same thing and you wonder and that's what we mean when we say stop normalizing him mm. don't say for him what he couldn't say himself report what he said just be the uh neutral uh fact teller here don't make up the fact that because he's president it has to have some sort of coherent policy or idea i'll give you another example of that this thread is by uh, Ilian Goldenberg, who's a foreign policy expert, talking about the Korea summit, which is on again, off again, on again, off again. Mm. Uh, somebody, <laughs> uh, somebody called it the uh, Schrodinger summit. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I, I think that that's a good one, and I out. think obviously that qualifies Trump for the Nobel Prize. Yes, but we'll it's see the physics what prize, not the peace prize. <laughs> All right, we'll see what happens. So Alien Goldenberg is talking about this and says, stop talking about Trump's negotiating playbook or strategy. That is a perfect stop. example, me interjecting, mm -hmm. of how the media normalizes Trump and tries to pull together coherent thinking when coherent thinking isn't there. Yeah. Trump's foreign policy, Goldenberg says, is characterized by intellectual laziness from an egomaniac who refuses to take advice. Advisors pretend there's a strategy but they're just reacting to Trump's erratic moves. Many examples. And this looks like a New York Times clip. I can't tell exactly because there's no link, but it's just the screenshot. Uh -huh. But it looks like New York Times. And it says, Trump's negotiating playbook faced test in North Korea. There's no playbook, he says. Come on, stop calling it a playbook. That's normalizing it and trying to put this into a presidential context that doesn't exist. And you're covering for him by not just, you know, saying uh, Trump's uh, midnight rambles face test in North Korea, because that would be closer to the truth. Yes. North Korea, for example. First, he undercuts Tillerson's negotiating effort, calls Kim Jong-un little rocket man and escalates for no reason. Then out of nowhere, with no consultation with advisors, he agrees to a summit that everybody thinks is a bad idea and is a big concession to the North Koreans sending his advisors scrambling. Then without consulting Japan or South Korea, he unilaterally walks, isolating us from our allies. And then his letter to Kim Jong-un is so pathetic and clearly shows a desire to do the summit that even while trying to look tough and walking away, he manages to weaken the U.S. position. All the while, he refuses to take actual briefings on the details of North Korea's nuclear program, which, after all, is a central subject of the summit. And that's Korea. Israel-Palestine? He talks for months about doing the ultimate deal, gets Kushner, Greenblatt, and a whole team working on it, meets with a boss at the UN in September, privately tells him he can get him a great deal. The 67 <laughs> lines with swaps that give him better land than the land he's given up. Total nonsense for anybody who knows anything about the conflict. It's like he's trying to sell him an apartment in Trump Tower. And then <laughs> boom, out of nowhere, moving the... Oh, that last interjection was me. And oh, then boom, out of nowhere, moving the embassy to Jerusalem with no political concessions with the Palestinians. He blows everything up, again, doing it all last minute with little consultation with his advisors. Palestinian senior delegation was at the White House two days before the announcement. Trump's team didn't even raise the possibility. No wonder they were so angry. And since then, just making it worse, choosing the day Palestinians commemorate the Nakba, or catastrophe, as the day to move the embassy and needlessly throwing fuel in the fire while cutting off aid, further destabilizing Gaza. In Iran, announcing time and again he will only stay in the deal if he gets concessions from Europe and Congress to fix the deal. Intense negotiations followed. The Europeans make significant concessions that could have allowed Trump to declare victory and push Iran. But when Macron and Merkel came to visit Trump in April and tried to convince him to stay, they came away with the impression he wasn't even familiar with any of the details of the negotiations. What? How could they come away with that impression? Weeks later, Trump unilaterally walks away. Now Iran is working with the other powers to save the deal while isolating the U.S., even as Pompeo has laid out an achievable list of demands, but no plan on how to achieve them. With China, he pushes us into new trade negotiations by threat of sanctions and tariffs, but then he refuses to engage in any detail and give his negotiators guidance, so they're all disagree amongst themselves, and the Chinese see it and try to split the negotiating. Then he publicized through Twitter major U.S. concessions causing immediate Hill backlash, reducing his negotiating space. The Hill is still backlashing over that in terms of the uh, ZTE uh, mm, yeah. uh, technology deal. Uh, to compensate, administration then leaks the major Chinese concessions, which, of course, causes the Chinese to walk them back. And then negotiations blow up. 
Then he undercuts our position in Syria, makes that worse. In all of these cases, there's been no strategy, no plan, no consultation. The president wakes up and decides on his own and everybody scrambles. This is not a playbook. It's pure ignorance, ego, and stupidity. Fortunately, we have yet to have a real foreign policy crisis, like an Ebola outbreak or genuine military standoff. Terrifying to think what happens at that point. Hmm. So that's where we're at. Uh, and yes. so the idea that the, the papers write this up is, oh, you know, hmm. I, I, my favorite pundit is the one that says, this is crazy. He doesn't know what he's doing, but it just might work. <laughs> That's like Tom Friedman sitting and doing a column talking to the cabbie right. and, and scrambling. But this – he's crazy, but it might work. Let's invade Iraq. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I mean I see the, the, the point and it's just a matter of like the rest of the world saying, well, the problem is he's crazy. We need to treat him as an idiot with no control over his impulses and so therefore – I guess – I guess well, what well, you do then is even, baby Even him. better summary. I know he's an idiot. He's ignorant. He doesn't know what he's doing. We better do this ourselves. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden, instead of waiting back and saying America will take care of it, ah. now they have to scramble and do it themselves. That's why North Korea and South Korea are meeting. Yes, true. Now, did Trump do that because out of strength, out of maximum pressure? No. <laughs> they did it because he's an idiot. And they were afraid of him. Yeah. And I mean, I guess if you're going to go with the it's so crazy, it just might work analysis, you might as well throw in there. The reason it might work is that everyone realizes that America is out of the picture now and can't be relied upon to do anything. And, right. and unreliable America yeah. out of the picture is not the result you want. For yeah. This. Oh, but but they acquiesce to our demands. Well, you know, in a sense, and in so doing, cutting America out of its leadership role that it's occupied traditionally since the end of World War II, but and, and this now might work. More influence. Great job, guys. Yes. So, uh, right. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you there. That's one of the worst takes possible, but uh, it'll always get you printed. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. It is Memorial Day and we're on the air live. The president's crazy. Get rid of him. Uh, now back to you, Greg. So, you know, this whole <laughs> idea yeah. that he might believe it if it's not a lie if you believe it jerry ah. this whole idea is kind of scary imagine the consequences of actually having to make decisions about nuclear weapons yes. i think i'm under attack i think they hate me i think they're trying to attack me first i'll i'll do it before they do that's why i canceled the summit i knew that, that they were going to cancel mm -hmm. oh that's true he did say that <laughs> so I, it could be what happens if he actually launches nuclear weapons because he thought that he was under attack and it turns out it isn't true. What does he do? Turn around and say, oh, my bad. Yeah. Well, and Maggie Haberman, the last thing she files before going into the bunker is, well, it's not a lie, per well, se. Well, we, we couldn't really know what he was yeah, thinking. Yeah, well, I don't know what his intention was. Yeah, I mean, I, I bring that up because I saw in her tweet that Daniel Dale included in his tweet storm that the last phrase in there, he often thinks whatever he says is what's real. And... So, okay, if I buy into the argument, that's a reason not to call it a lie per se, but why not call it the insane ramblings of an incompetent moron who'll kill us all before he does anything in the interest of the United States, never belonged in the presidency in the first place, and by rights should be locked up as a mental patient. Could we say that? Mm. No? All right. Uh, do I, legal tells me we have to back off. Ah, uh, so, you know, right, okay, so it's not a lie. He's incompetent to the task, and 
uh, as a journalist, I might as well say there's almost very little point in my covering things that he says from day to day because he's not describing anything in particular that the rest of us acknowledge as reality. So how do I write a story about that? Uh, I mean, there there certain, certainly has to be a note somewhere in here that says the person I'm quoting has no grasp of reality and frequently thinks whatever he says is real. So please keep that in mind as I read you his quotes. Yeah, and also that, by the way, he's he's a uh, serial liar. Yes, and a nuclear arms <laughs> On top of that. Liar. Right. You know, so, so sometimes he doesn't know what's true, and sometimes he just flat out lies. So, that's and it's true. all about his own right. political preservation. It's the only motivating core for him. Yeah, I guess if we were somehow to cure him of this inability to discern reality, there would be the underlying reality of that he is, in fact, a serial liar. So I don't know how much better we're doing. We've got him grounded in reality. He's just a liar now. Mm. Hmm. Great. So uh, Jason Johnson has this really interesting piece over at The Root which is on um, kind of the genesis of this whole uh, issue about what's going on with the children and some of the uh, rumors thereof. Okay. The title of it is, is the Trump administration running a child trafficking ring or nah? Follow me down the rabbit hole. Uh, They might be. No, he's not. But but this is is how this happens. But there might be another one. Yeah. Okay. So Donald Trump has been the conspiracy whisperer throughout his entire public life. And then uh, Johnson lists – and Johnson, by the way, is a very solid reporter and analyst. Uh, so he lists all the different conspiracy theories that uh, Trump is associated with from the birther one to the Central Park Five are guilty. And then uh, Trump and his administration have done since the White House. Uh, Jake Tapper listed a half a dozen unfounded or disproven conspiracy theories. Uh, Transformer microwaves by Obama to spy on the Trump White House. Black Lives Matter being a terrorist organization. Democrats running a child sex trafficking ring out of a pizza place in Washington, D.C., also known as Pizzagate. Now, his base eats by it up way. and loves it, and they mm. love talking about it on Reddit. Yeah. And, and, and so you have the, the alt-right doing these conspiracy theories. And then some factual things. And Johnson's trying to illustrate how people get riled up about it to the point of actually going a little bit overboard. So here's what happens. Here's what we know. In August of 2017, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, asked permission from the Trump administration to start destroying old files and documents relating to 11 subjects. The subjects include reports of violence, solitary confinement, death and sexual abuse inflicted on those detained by ICE while still in their custody. That's it's still records. being determined how long those reports would be held before being destroyed. Two years, 20 years, six weeks, ICE is insane. And congressional candidates have found the policy so disturbing they've begun to campaign on it. And he gives an example. Yes. Why would they destroy them at all? I don't know. There are some administrative records that you do after uh, 20 years, some after seven years. That's what happens with medical records. Uh, you know, if you're in pediatrics, you got to keep them like forever. Same thing with uh, OBGYN. But, you know, um, there are uh, uh, statutes of limitations about when records can be destroyed. And if they're paper records, they're cumbersome mm. and they take up space. So yes. that's why you would think about destroying them or at least housing them somewhere else. Hmm. Huh. Well, uh, yeah, some of them, I suppose I would think about. I mean, you asked about yeah. what the reason would be. That's the yeah. reason. Well, that's the, the reason. High. I overrule. <laughs> so that, that's fine. I mean, maybe yeah. that's okay, but in this case, you can't. Right. But but that would be the reason. Okay. So April 26, 2018, during a Senate hearing, Stephen Wagner, Acting Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, said the department has lost nearly 1,500 unaccompanied minors who have been placed in homes and facilities since being picked up at the border. Over a thousand human beings lost like luggage, a cell phone or a fancy hat. Our government can track what porn sites ISIS or the Islamic State is clicking on in the mountains of Afghanistan, but they can't find 1,500 kids in America. What's worse, this is Jason Johnson writing, nobody seems to know what to do about it. This is despite reports that children have been placed in homes where they were sexually assaulted, abused or possibly trafficked. So there may have been situations where the homes they were placed were suspect. Uh, now, sure. if you know anything at all, and hopefully you don't, oh. but professionally I need to, 
if you know anything at all about the Department of uh, Children and Families, DCF, or, or they have different names in different states, yes. uh, we're responsible for taking care of children who need foster homes. It's always an incredibly messy situation. And the foster care situations that kids are placed in come with varying degrees of skill on the part of the parents. That's almost certainly true and a very gentle way of saying it, yes. Well, you know, it's necessary. Sometimes the homes are being taken out of are just horrendous. I don't want to cast dispersion on foster families. Right. Um, but, you know, you can find some that are just not up to the standards. You can. And so this exists. So if you find that you took 1,500 kids and placed them in 1,500 different homes, it's a pretty good chance that, you know, some of the homes at the bottom end, shall we say, uh, are, are not necessarily going to be up to snuff. Yes. That's, that is not the same thing as children are being taken by the government and given to human traffickers. It's not. Right? But May well, 8th, be the 2018, same thing be Attorney General Jeff Sessions announces, if you're caught sneaking across the border as a family, you'll be prosecuted and separated from your children, which will lead to more children being taken from the safety of their parents and then suspiciously lost in the system somewhere in America. May 11, 2018, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly doubles down on the new Trump white nationalist and human rights violating policy of separating parents from minor children. And Jason Johnson here is getting to the heart of it. I mean, the whole policy is awful. Yes. You don't have to invoke selling them to traffickers to get to the point that you don't separate children from their parents. It's just a horrible thing to do. And he wouldn't be doing this if all the refugees are from Norway. That is true, too. When asked what will happen to separated kids, Kelly states the children will be taken care of, put into foster care, or whatever. Obviously, whatever includes everything from being placed in a nice living home and adopted by Daddy Warbucks, Jason Johnson writes, or Mitt Romney, to falling off the hmm. grid and being abused, sold, or worse, by any random stranger who shows up at Homeland Security offering to help, that's air quotes around to help, mm -hmm. those displaced kids. All right. So this has happened before. And none of this means that Jeff Sessions and Donald Trump are part of some vast conspiracy to sell minority children to the highest bidder. No, but he would make sure he why, was getting a cut. So, that so that's how the genesis of this. Oh, my God, they're selling them to traffickers comes out. And you see that on the Web. We've been ignoring it and not making it the central part of the story. The central part of the story is that the kids are being separated from their parents. And if you want to get into what is the status of national foster homes, uh -huh. who inspects them, what's the standard and stuff like that. And that's a whole nother issue altogether. But uh, as Johnson concludes, which story sounds better? Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions continue their white nationalist policies by destroying refugee and undocumented immigrant families, or Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions let missing children fall play, prey to sex traffickers. If you can't figure out which is the better conspiracy, imagine any of this happening at this level under the Obama administration. Which story do you think Trump would tweet? He's never been one to let facts get in the way of a good conspiracy. Yes. Oh, well, I will add in the background to this, which one do I think Trump would tweet? Obviously, Trump would tweet the one about the kids falling into the hands of sex traffickers. And as with most things with him, this is projection and he is a sex trafficker. <laughs> and so it's very well, difficult to back away from the story. The anybody of anything means he did it. Yeah, yeah I, I well, get that part. I mean, but yeah, I, I, like, I, yeah, I, it's a good point. Imagine it being said about the Obama administration. Well, I, if if I, it would be difficult to say that that was the case, people would say it. They would say it because they want to, you know, paint Obama with whatever lies they can come up with. Um, it's I mean, just also know, the my, case my that he didn't is, run a teenage is, modeling agency. But the whole point is that uh, the policy of separating families is awful in and of itself. Concentrate on that. I don't think there's much to this uh, sex trafficking thing, although you may well find individuals who happen to have this problem because of the state of the foster care situation. Yeah. So does that mean that, therefore, we should refrain from ever talking about it? No. I mean, you might as well call a blogger ethics conference over this. I mean, it's yes. we know what the Trump yes. side would do. Right. With it. I don't really care. I'm not exorcised about the fact that people have brought this up as a minor point to a major story. I'm just saying, let's just pay attention to the major story and say, huh, to the rest, and, you know, let things come out the way that they come out. All right. All right I will so just on. say, huh, a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, That's I it. mean, I agree. It's a, 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 and certainly under normal circumstances, and we know what that means. Under normal circumstances, I would say, come on, that's outrageous. What would you focus on that for when there's this other major story that we know is true? And, you know, okay, that's that's absolutely the way you should approach even this one and say, well, let's first of all try and do something about people being separated from their kids. That we know we can, first of all, find, identify, and hopefully do something about. Um and yeah, you can prioritize them that way. And I can't argue with that. And uh, it certainly is weird and outrageous and unexplored territory to be <laughs> in a place where you have to say, as as I think you do at some point along the way, and you can't stop anybody from doing it and saying, huh, it is uniquely troubling. And I mean, Listen, we have troubling. experience with this. OK, just yeah. substitute P tape for sex trafficking. <laughs> we, we know what to do with the P tape. We know it's out there. It's real. I'm not saying don't talk about it. Everybody okay. is aware it's in the dossier. Yeah, we're going to huh. get it. Okay, but there's so many other things to talk about here. Yes. Okay, and that's certainly uh, you got to. Everybody's got to prioritize in some way. Right. And uh, so let me just give you a little uh, tweet storm on that because, of course, we have one. Yes. And uh, let's see. This one will be from uh, Ryan Teague Beckwith. Okay. Okay. Here's every line of argument that Trump and his allies have made about the Russia investigation. Russia didn't meddle in the election. I don't believe they interfered. That is a direct quote. Someone meddled, but it might not be Russia. And the quote <laughs> is, it may be Russia or China or another country or group, or it may be a 400 pound genius sitting in bed and playing with his computer. Did you say genius? Yeah. Three, someone meddled, but we'll probably never know who. If you don't catch a hacker, okay, in the act, it's very hard to say who did the hacking. These are all quotes. Someone meddled, but it's Obama's fault they weren't stopped. If Russia or some other entity was hacking, why did the White House wait so long to act? The answer is Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. Another example who threatened to publicize the whole thing prior to the election and the Obama administration decided that was not a good idea. Another example. Every time he sees me, he says, I didn't do that. And I really believe that when he tells me he means it. And he's talking about Putin. Russia may have meddled, but the Trump campaign didn't collude. The Russian hoax was that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. It never did. That's a quote. And then in the New York Times, that story, as per our previous discussion, is entitled Trump falsely claims I never said <laughs> Russia did not meddle. OK, that's how you have to do it all the time. Democrats made up the idea the Trump campaign colluded with Russia as an excuse for losing the election. He's even done that recently. It's an excuse by the Democrats for having lost an election they should have won. And that was uh, uh, quoted on NBC News. Another example, Re Putin, somebody did say if he did do it, you wouldn't have found out about it, which is a very interesting point. Then the fake news media made up the idea the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. Funny how the fake news media doesn't want to say the Russian group was formed in 2014, long before my run for president. That's because the people you took into your um, campaign were collaborators. Yes. That's your problem. You did that. Not proof of innocence. Another example, it's a Democratic hoax that was brought up as an excuse. Good for him for saying Democratic, not Democrat. That's because he's, you know, actually was a Democrat for a long time. It's the Democratic hoax that was brought up as an excuse for losing an election that, frankly, the Democrats should have won. A criminal deep state and the government made up the idea. You get the idea. You can just there, there's like dozens of this. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. And he just keeps changing the story. And you step back and look at all of this and say, OK, so what does it matter? What difference does it make? What difference does it make to voters? And that's going to be the subject of my last part of this segment. Ah, okay. Where is this? Is back with? Is that what you said, Ryan? Yeah. All right. Is this not on the list? Or uh, I'm it looking. may not it's have been on the list. Oh, okay. But, but, but I'll give oh, it to you. I want to give that to everybody else. I wanted to follow along, but I just listened to you, so we're okay. Those of us listening live, who come later, will say. Well, I just. Gave David the link, so why can't you people listening just look at it? I don't know. He said it. he just read it to you. Just type that into Google, guys. Ryan Teague, T E A G U E Beckwith. Yes. And he, he tweets it at Ryan Beckwith, and you could look him up and just read it there. Yeah. What's your problem? So uh, <laughs> let's Me. look. Let's look yes. at uh, civics. I'm really getting into this civics stuff here. C I V I Q S. Oh, I this is not a Daily Coast um, shop. It is associated with Coast Media, which is a different entity altogether. Oh, <laughs> LLC. It's true. Well, it but it is. is. It's, yeah. So it's not Daily Coast. I know. And, 
And uh, oh, so man. they are doing uh, national polling on a whole bunch of things. And right now, the publicly available stuff is, do you approve or disapprove of the way Donald Trump is handling his job as president? Yes. And also, um, if election for U.S. House of Representatives were held today, would you vote for the Democrat or the Republican? Now, a couple of things I want to throw out there first. All right. Okay. And first, uh, G. Elliott Morris, who is a political scientist who's been uh, following this all along, uh, gives the Democrats about a 56 percent chance of taking the House. And his opinion has not changed, even though this month there's been more favorable information on the side of Republicans. One of them. Okay is a Reuters poll, which all of a sudden out of the blue had an outlier number showing the Republicans plus six on the generic ballot out of nowhere. That is out of nowhere. Yeah. Actually, it's back to Democrats plus seven this week. So it it, it was just a blip. You know, every once in a while, even a good poll, 95 percent confidence limits means five percent of the time you just get a bogus number. Right. Or Ferris Bueller hacked it. That's what that was. It was a bogus number. So it's back to its D plus seven which is what it's been running all along. And really nothing has changed. And Morris points this other fact out, which I think is very important. The number of competitive Republican held House seats in the November midterms, 72. The number of competitive Democratic held House seats in the November midterms, seven. Oh. So there are 10 times more competitive Republican seats than competitive Democratic seats, kind of the opposite of what you see in the, in the Senate. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, the Republicans very much are at risk. A lot of it has to do with what's happening in California, which we'll get to as well, because California is just fascinating, and that primary is June 5th. But looking at uh, do you approve or disapprove of the way Donald Trump is handling his job as president? I gave you those uh, links. It just says civics. Yep, I see them. On the list. And we're looking at various and sundry things. And right now, um, if you're just looking at everybody and uh, you don't have these links, I don't think, because I was really going to concentrate on the generic battle. But just to let people know, Donald Trump's job approval, 50 percent disapproved, 44 percent approved. And it really hasn't changed all that much. It's a little bit narrower than, uh, let's say, last November, uh, where uh, this is a, a six point. Uh, disapprove over approve, but that uh, disapprove just about never goes under 50. And that's really the important thing. And if you look at various segments of the population, um, it's actually a 10 point lead right now, 53, 43. If you look at independents only, which is the more interesting group because the Democrats hate them and Republicans love them, then independents uh, disapprove of Trump 50 to 44. Hey, that's the same number. Uh, yeah, that's the one I was looking at. Uh, oh, it's a 10-point lead for everybody, but a, uh, a six-point lead for uh, independents. But let's look at the indip- – if the election for the U.S. House of Representatives were held today, who would you vote for? Oh. Okay, remember, we're talking about the fact that um, the, the Reuters about? poll is back to a D plus seven. And we've talked about this on the air before with the Democratic line of uh, voting for the Democratic candidate is just flat. It's straight. You can draw it with a ruler. And what varies is the Republican line when it goes for someone else back to Republicans. Uh And so when that generic ballot widens, it's because Republicans are given up. And when the generic ballot tightens, it's because Republicans are going home. But the Democrats do not waver in their detaste distaste for Republican candidates. So right now it's a five point lead on civics. It's a seven point lead in Reuters. It's all over the map, depending Mm. upon which poll you look at. And the overall uh, 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 average of all of them is about six. And that's about where it's been. So it really hasn't changed. What has changed is that there's been some slight narrowing, particularly on the part of independents and Republicans, because the one thing that Trump has done this month that people like as opposed to neutral or hate, the one thing he's done that people like is this whole Korea thing, Hmm. right? If you you look at Trump's um, overall approval, 
it actually has improved since the Korea stuff has been in the news. Well, that's, I mean, that's good for him, except that it didn't happen and might not, but, but yeah. But, well, see, but the, the point of all of that is why is he so desperate to have this summit? Yes. Well, he's because, got nothing Because to do. of what I just told you. Yeah, I guess that's it. He, he, someone told him it was good for his polls. He is not polls. thinking about this in terms of what's good for the United States. Oh, that's as a national leader, what's good for the world, uh, or uh, how this uh, positions us 20 years from now, or what it means for the uh, uh, Asian area in terms of uh, U.S. influence. No, it's all about how does it help me in the polls. I was told that and, we were supposed to get away from that. But that's how he looks at it, and that's why he's mm. so desperate to have a summit. So you look at that and you say, well, there probably will be one. Because he feels like he needs one. Yes. It will, by the way. Once he realizes that it will be the highest rated U.S.-North Korea summit in history, mm. he'll definitely do it. Now, forget about the fact that he's already given up the store on it. We talked about that earlier in the show. and, and I've already the forgotten. Week. The point is that he's looking at it in terms of what's good for him. Let's look at the generic ballot, and let's look at it in terms of individual segments. And I, I hope you don't mind, but I actually, since I'm not working today, I can go a little bit longer after the next break. I was I want to talk about California after the next break. <laughs> this, is, this is why I came here today. Free show. Yeah. Free show. Uh, so uh, let's look at the U.S. generic ballot, and let's just look overall. Right now, Civics has a five-point lead for the Democrats, 47-42. And that uh, really doesn't fluctuate that much uh, day to day. Let's go back to the beginning of May. On May 1st, it was a six-point lead. Now it's a five-point lead. The Democrats were 46. Now they're 47. The Republicans were 40. Now they're 42. So again, the, the fluctuation tends to be mostly on the Republican side. But th th those are small numbers. It really hasn't changed all that much. What's fascinating is to look at the generic ballot based on demographic breakout. You want to do age, you want to do education, or do you want to do party and look at independence? Your uh, choice. We'll do them all, but which, yeah, one, okay. which order do you want to do? Uh, well, how about age? Why not? Age. Okay. Age. So let's let's look at the over 65s. Okay. Oh, all right. They want Republicans 49-43. And so I would say mm -hmm. all this year for 2018, that hasn't changed all that much. Early uh, 2018, late 2017, it was closer but now it's about a six point lead for uh, Republicans and the 50 to 64 is just about tied 47, 44 Republican in the 35 to 49 range, 47, 40 Democrat and 1834 age range millennials, hmm. 53, 31 Democrats. OK, wow. 31. Everybody else is just about tied. Millennials hate Trump. Yeah, well, good. OK. This is why on last uh, uh, Monday or last week, we were talking about what's the election all about. It's whether or not millennials show. It's a very, very close election with everybody except millennials. 50 and up slightly favor Trump, f slightly favor Republicans. Mm -hmm. Under 50, mm -hmm. the 35 to 49 favors Democrats a bit. And the 18 to 34 are overwhelmingly Democrat. If they show up at elections, we win. If they don't, we lose. Well, I say get a bunch of avocados to the polls. No. Yeah. And that should do the trick. That is why things like Parkland and rallying around high school safety uh, uh, and things of that sort make a major, major difference. Now, if you're looking at it just in terms of gender, 5236 Democratic for women and 4940 Republican for men. So the where is the children part of it? You know, some males care, but uh, uh, women definitely care. And so that could be a resonating issue as well. If you look at non-college and college, uh, which is, of course, important, uh, the non-college, uh, 46, 42, uh, Democrat hmm. overall. These are registered voters. Uh, college, uh, 47, 43 Democrat. Okay. And post grads, 51, 39 Democrat. Well, the more you know. Well, well but this makes the point. Yes. 
that uh, the Democratic Party is in some ways becoming an interesting mix of college graduate professionals, white collar, taking people who used to be more likely to be Republicans. That's one uh, subsegment of the generic of the uh, uh, of the demographic uh, generic demographic that's really shifted shifted. Hmm. Post postgraduates are the sense. most likely. Non college graduate, college graduate, postgraduate, postgraduates are the ones that are most likely to be democratic these days. Hmm. Well, uh, and that was that not the case? I felt like it, it, it was. wasn't something I would have expected. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I would, I, mean, said, I would have said college graduates, uh, a little more closer to their working class roots. But now that at least they've gone I, to oh, college and, and uh, they're a little bit okay. more sympathetic. They've they've gotten out in the world. They've they've moved away from home. I would have thought that would have been the group that's most likely to be Democratic uh, supporting. Uh, but no, they are 47, 43. But postgrads are 51, 39. I see. And uh, so, OK, well, I'd be interested to see what that has been. Historically, for post grads, I have a theory. Right. For this is a new poll, so I don't have case. it in this poll. Oh, but okay. yeah, it would be interesting. But uh, my 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 theory is that uh, the more it's a small you, number, by the well, way. the more you invest in long term in your education and the social system and w order of the world, the less interested you are in a chaos agent. But you know, not necessarily true. Uh, uh, industry by industry, for example, we know, uh -huh. and, and I've done this on your show, a few years back we looked at doctors, and we know that pediatricians, uh, infectious disease doctors, internal medicine, primary care tend to favor Democrats, uh -huh. where, whereas uh, orthopedists and high-end uh, making uh, dollars, neurosurgeons, uh -huh. Rand Paul's and, and Ben Carson's tend to favor Republicans. Uh, yeah, I suppose the medical... Uh, industry such as it is would, it would have a certain you're never going to have a never-ending supply of people in need of medical care regardless of chaos and in fact maybe more under a chaotic president and we see him we take All care right. of him. we'll take a break and come right back Welcome back now to the Kangaroo in the Morning Show on Netroots Radio. Greg Dworkin still with us, at least briefly. No work today. That's nice. It's a good day off, and uh, it should be a day off for me too, which is which is why I'm so glad to have the extended segment. Mm. So uh, I want to spend a little bit of time then talking about the Republican primary and Democratic primary, which is to say a jungle primary because it's all mixed together, coming up on June 5th in California. Ah. Okay. We talked about the generic ballot and the fact that the Democrats are still well poised to take back the House, even if by a narrow margin. It could be a wider margin or it could be no margin at all, depending upon what happens in California. There's like seven seats there that are potentially competitive. And one of the more interesting uh, focus points might be um, the specific seats of Republicans that you'd really, 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 really like to beat. Uh, a Daryl Issa. Or uh, I'm going to focus on, just to make the point, Dana Rohrbacher. Hmm, okay. right? Now, I'm not from California. Some of our very attuned uh, California uh, political people who might be listening to the show, either up early or, or by podcast later, might have more to say and a lot of corrections to make. I'm just trying to give the overall big picture here. Okay. And what happens is that in California, for reasons that we can discuss, California decided a few years back that they were going to do a jungle primary. Top two get on the ballot. If it's a special election, then if somebody gets 51 or 50.1 percent, that is to say of the vote, they win. And if not, top two go on for election. In a general election, mm -hmm. the top two get to be the two people who run against each other in the general. That's how the primary works in California. And to illustrate this point, I pulled up the district for Dana Rohrbacher. Everybody's favorite Russian congressman. Uh, yes. Okay. I, I guess that has to be true. Right. So this is uh, District uh, 48. All right. All right. And just look at the list All of right who's running. Okay. And, and cool. there's a, a couple of ways you can do that. Um, but in this particular case, uh, let's just use Ballotpedia. Okay. The following candidates are running in the top two primary. 
One of them is the incumbent, Dana Rohrabacher. That leaves one other slot. And who's going to fill that slot? Here are the people running. Hans Kirstedt, Michael Kotick, Laura Oatman, Rachel Payne, Harley Ruda, Dini Sharsmith, Omar Siddiqui, and Tony Zarkadis on the Democratic side. Yes. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people running on the Democratic side. Some of them are not really running. Well, I'll get to that. And on the Republican side, you have, uh, and this is for the second slot because Rora Barker is one of them, but also Scott Ball, John Gabbard, Paul Martin, Stellan Onufri, uh, Shastina Sandman, and then there's a Libertarian, Brandon Reeser, and a nonpartisan, Kevin Kensinger. Okay. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen people running for slot number two. That's very competitive. Eight, eight of which are Democrats. The worry is that yes. the Democrats will split the vote amongst them, mm-hmm. and one of the Republicans will get that second spot. Yes, I can see okay. that. So the Democratic National Group is trying to take steps so that that won't happen. Some of the people on the Democratic side, like Rachel Payne, Laura Oatman, Michael Kotick, mm. have dropped out. Some of them have even endorsed Harley Ruda, who is the person that the National Democrats have selected as being the person who should be in that second slot. They're trying to winnow it down, and they're sending out mailings that these other people have dropped out and endorsed Harley Ruda. All right, well. So everybody should vote for Ruda, right? Well, that's what they would hope. If you, if you want a Democrat to run against that. Well, there's a problem. Oh. It's a lot of problems, but there's a You're problem. <laughs> One of the Democrats, Hans Kirsted, has been endorsed by the California Democratic Party. Not the national ah. group, but the California group. Well, then. Uh, he's not problem, dropping out, it? and he's not going to endorse Harley Ruda. Uh, no, I guess not. That seems... And, yeah, okay. So for, for people who are... Uh liberal voters and hate party apparatus and i guess some of them, some might hate the national apparatus and not the state apparatus some might hate the opposite some might hate both uh yeah where, where well hmm what do you do uh i don't know can we answer that just is there a, is there a, well let, we just remember what happened in texas you know with with know um, happened. with what? laura moser oh where the yes. national party came in and said no 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 we're going to support uh, her opponent. Right. And everybody got all upset about it, but the opponent won. And uh, everybody's solid about what to do about that. You know, so the, the split in the party that one was looking for didn't happen in Texas. What happens in California? I don't Hans know. Hans Kirstead was endorsed by the California uh, Democrats. Yes. But the national Democrats are supporting Harley Rhoda. That is not good. And Kirstead's annoyed about it. Yes. Now, he may have his own issues. He may. Uh, he was a professor. Stuff was brought up about whether or not he had issues with uh, some of his students of a female persuasion. He says that didn't happen. And at the same time, some of the people who have dropped out are women. And women are powering the resistance. Women are powering sure. the opposition. So how does that play out? Nobody knows yet. Uh, polling doesn't help us. And so what's going to happen if some of the people who were dropped from running are they dropping out because they were forced to or are you forcing women out? i mean it's a whole bunch of of 2018 in a nutshell tied in just with this one district and nobody exactly knows how it's going to play out it could be that okay it was a great story harley ruda won the second slot that's the end of the discussion thanks for getting everybody all upset about the prospects of being shut out or it could be that the democrat is shut out yes well that that does happen a bit see now hmm well, I, I don't know how the process works, uh, but yeah, you you might have hoped, for instance, that someone would have said, hey, I heard the state party has made an endorsement. Why should we swim upstream? And, you know, but people will have their reasons and they'll get back and say, well, they endorsed the wrong person, period. 
uh, and that's bad news, but what do we do? Sit here and take it or what? Well, you know, occasionally you have to, I guess, if you want to win the second slot in the jungle primary. Well, right. I, I'd this, love to this see is the from the New York Times. It. The okay. National Party's involvement has angered Hans Kerstad, a stem has cell it? scientist wow. who has the support of the California Democratic Party and is now scorning the National Campaign Committee after a mutual flirtation for much of the last year. Mr. Kerstad said the committee got spooked because of a 2009 investigation at the University of California, Irvine, into whether he had struck one of his female graduate students when he was a professor there. He was cleared by the school, which found the charges to be unfounded, but said National Democrats were unhappy. He would not urge some of his female former students to go on camera and defend him. An official with the national campaign said they did urge Mr. Kerstad to offer evidence refuting the charge, but they didn't demand the students appear on camera. Mm. Kerstad says he's not dropping out, but the candidate logjam is exasperating area activists who've been organizing for a year and a half against Mr. Rohrabacher, a vocal supporter of Mr. Trump, and I would add uh, Mr. Putin. Yes. Wow. Well, that sucks. I mean, <laughs> what do I tell you? Can't tell you what to do. That's going to have to be answered right. by I can't California. tell you what to do, but... Holy smokes. <laughs> Holy smokes is right. God. So I look back and say, you know, I just frankly don't understand the California Democratic Party. Now, you step back and you say, yeah, but part of this is trying to be more inclusional. And, you know, less of a, of a run by Washington kind of thing. Ah. But as Matt Iglesias has pointed out, it's hard to think of this as anything other than incumbents from both parties doing the jungle primary to make sure that nobody challenges them because that way the challengers get split. Yes. Uh, that's very likely the case. It does. It, it's it, an oddity like that is always going to be looked askance at. And, uh, that's the most likely explanation. I, I, I'm curious how people I mean how to well we'd have to ask again here we have to leave it to the California voters what do you make of this thing and I guess until it makes a problem for you in your district you're probably indifferent to it well it's been that way for however long and and how long has it been is it just forever or is it recent I don't know Californians right. have to say so huh sorry Californians I don't have any information for you on what the hell's going on and you may have little or no information yourself but, wow, well, okay, that's rough. Same I'm just means. saying. So gives I you an idea listening. of what's going on, gives you an idea of what some of the stakes are, and gives you an idea stakes. of uh, why it's so complicated. And, and the two things that made people pause and say about that democratic wave, not so fast, one was the Reuters poll and generic tightening, which is or is not there depending upon which poll you see. And the other was, okay, now that it's getting real, Let's take a look at California, which is the place where mm. Democrats really ought to do well, because a lot of these are Clinton voting districts and it's a mess. And maybe things will work out in the worst possible way for Democrats. And that's part of the reason why there's been a pause. <laughs> that plus maybe. the idea that the uh, Korea summit as fractious and ridiculous and unplanned uh, as as it has been looks OK for Trump in the media because they don't do nuance and they don't do complexity. Mm -hmm. They just do Trump says he's going to have a summit and it's the first time ever. So it's and so win. it plays well politically, at least until something bad happens. But something yes. bad happens is in the future. You know, talking about having a summit and going for peace instead of war right now is something that's going to play well. You put all of that together and Democrats look a little bit less wavy than they did a week ago. But mm -hmm. under the surface, things haven't changed all that much. Yeah, that's true and disheartening <laughs> don't don't lose heart however but yeah don't that's, lose uh, heart. That's don't, those... don't pay attention to the oh, oh maybe it's not there the intensity is there as amy walter pointed out the other day i think i did this on the show with you uh, uh last week is that uh, the dislike trumps strongly are double mm. the like trump strongly when you look at those polls and intensity matters and intensity especially matters in midterm elections Yes. Not the margin, the intensity. Uh, yeah. The enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. There enthusiasm. Just, there you go. Ready this time. As soon as you started talking about this one, I said, ah, I know what's you going on. You had it lined up. Good for you. Yeah. I was paying attention this time. I, this is, uh, I'm amazed. I'm now stunned by the California story. I mean, it's just the one district, but it's probably happening 
in a number of them. This is just one example. It is, it is happening in a number, and that's the best example I could think yeah. of. But you get the idea. God, it is incredible that uh, this gets in the way so frequently. And, I mean, well, it would be in Democratic hands to change this. Yeah. In California. So why don't now? they, well, I, I, you know, you, you, you step back and you look from outside California and say, you, you know, know what, you guys, I'm you sure really that, screwed up. I'm sure that activists really on the ground have been saying for, I'm sure there are some who've said nothing, but I'm sure there are plenty who are saying this, this system is stupid. It's, it's a detriment to what we're doing here. We have to, and it's in our hands to turn it over. Let's well, do it. I, and then I they thought say, gerrymandering I, was a good idea because it protects me, even though I know it screws the rest of the state. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, like nobody's well, ever said that, right? Right. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, this is uh, something I'll have to watch to see how it works out. But, I mean, really, at this point, like, you got to f- find a way to make sure that there's a, you know, a Democrat on the ballot in each district for situations like this. And I guess I'm sure they celebrate that in, you know, 75 percent of the districts, there's two Democrats in some places will be running. And you can't lose except – do you really even want that to happen? I don't know. It's it is a mess. I'd love to know the history of uh, the genesis of this system, and I'd love to know what people said when they were thinking about implementing it. I don't know how far back I have to go, but uh, maybe well, maybe we'll get a Californian who's an expert or purports to be to chime in. I would in love that. Us know. You know, maybe Dave Dyan or somebody who yeah, really I mean, has an idea of what's going on can explain I what's going on. I bet he knows, and I bet, he's, and I bet he's done it. And if I do a little research, you can find it. Mm. But I uh, can't do that now. It's 1014. Right. So let me just end with one uplifting story just for huh. a little bit. This is uh, from the Associated Press, uh, Nick Riccardi, who uh, studies all things Midwest. And this one is from Oklahoma. And uh, the title is Resistance Makes Subtle Impact Even Where Trump is Popular. And it's a story about Edmond, Oklahoma, and about how people who were really upset about Trump winning, even in places that went solidly for him, Mm -hmm. women, of course, uh, could find like-minded souls and reach out, even in places that are very, very conservative. Even in Edmond, Oklahoma, this particular person, Vicki Toombs, has found her sisters in arms, and it's the reach of anti-Trump forces into red states like Oklahoma that gives Democrats hope of a national resurgence, though no one suggests the heartland will change its political allegiance on a dime. Regardless, mm. the simple act of local liberals emerging from their shells has the potential to subtly change the dynamics in places like Edmond. You know, it's one thing ah. if everybody in your town thinks something, and it's another thing if you realize that a third of the town thinks something else. It gives you pause for many people, especially in small towns, when you know who you're talking about. Yes. And it, it, it moderates you a bit. So that's really the point here. I can see that it would. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that reminds me of another story that I had from last week, and maybe you saw this one uh, that actually centered on, on the, the gun issue. But the Washington Post's piece uh, that was entitled, what was it, Gun Violence's Distant Echo, about a, a uh, high school student and, you know, one of the kids who joined in the Never Again movement, taking up off in the footsteps of the Parkland students, organizing in Gillette, Wyoming, all by herself for the most part. And uh, just the idea that, uh, well, her standing up and making a sensible case in the face of opposition up to and including her entire family and everyone discouraged her from doing it but she shows up at the school board and makes a statement and doesn't necessarily change the course of history for Gillette Wyoming but she finds that people say you know as much as they tease her about things and love their guns and dislike what she's doing say you know what it's it's all right I can respect what you're doing what you're saying here uh, you make a good case. I disagree with you in general on guns, but maybe I'll listen to you about arming teachers, perhaps. Mm. And uh, yeah, and with that, I think states. I'll call this segment to a close. I think I've overstayed as it is. So uh, you got don't. 45 minutes left. Uh, I hope you had your breakfast, and I hope I was able to help. But uh, yes. these were stuff that was on my mind, and uh, you know, we'll talk more about it on uh, Wednesday when I'm back. Right. Plus, you'll feel better today, so that's good. Yeah. Get to talk. Thanks very much, Greg. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, it's like a it's, it's a half a day off for me, I say. And a therapy session for you. Right. Excellent. All right. Thanks again, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Okay. Take care. You too. All right. Let's check in with all this. Ooh. As a matter of fact, uh, 
Well, I'll read you a little bit. It's a bit of a long read, but, uh, you know, and I think I gave you the, the general tenor of the piece. But again, it's uh, Washington Post, Gun Violence's Distant Echo. Uh, subhead here, after school shootings, a teenager challenges the gun culture in her conservative Wyoming town. And we're talking about Mariah Engdahl, 16-year-old, uh, pictured here with her, her dad, Alan, talking about the gun issue and the, uh, the lonely role of leadership that she took up in challenging uh, positions on the issue. Uh, great story. Eli Saslow is the writer here, a May 18th story. Uh, so uh, here another here's a Washington Post reporter who traveled to the heartland to go and interview Trump supporters, among others, and including someone who is not, but who is too young to vote at the moment, uh, and finding a story of actual national interest as opposed to, hey, Trump voters say they still like Trump. So well done there. And uh, well done, really, to Mariah, who works extraordinarily hard to get her message across in almost complete isolation. She actually manages to assemble a small group of students who are one by one picked off by uh, parents and community members and peers who discourage them from participating in anything that could be interpreted as anti-gun and, you know, the the standard uh, set of characters here in Wyoming, anybody who, who, who you know, plenty of people who think anybody who would argue anything about uh, that, that would lead to a policy that you couldn't carry as many guns as you could possibly hold to as many places as you could possibly imagine going is a, a, a gun grabber and going to confiscate all your weapons, melt them down and put you in a prison camp. And so in the face of all of that, even getting together with a small group of like-minded students at the Starbucks is difficult because someone might hear you. And they have to whisper to one another because they get angry glances uh, from the coastal elites sipping lattes in Starbucks there in Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, it's a very interesting dynamic and uh, and a great story. And she does a great job uh, culminating in her making her way to the school board meeting and uh, by the way, I guess I should uh, I should take note of how that appearance went. And let me scroll down and try and find that section of it, because I, I thought it was uh, it was very interesting. And the way she approaches everything. Uh, well, maybe we'll start about three quarters of the way down and and give you a taste for how she prepares for her meeting. Mariah here says she wanted to prepare by learning everything she could about guns. So a few days before the meeting, she traveled across town to a house where four mounted animal heads were on display above the entryway. It was Mariah's mother's house, uh, Tracy. Her parents are divorced, and she lives with her dad. She went to see her mom. Uh, Tracy, I, I don't know whether she goes by Engdahl, but Tracy was inside talking about a future hunting trip. Her stepfather, Mariah's, was downstairs at his custom-built reloading station, which was stocked with bullet casings and gunpowder. You get the picture. Uh, so she goes and asks some questions, right? What is all this stuff? Mariah asked him, pointing to the shells and the weight scales. I don't really understand much about gun stuff. Her stepdad, like most of the people in town, a, a not-so-gentle ribbing about that. Yeah, I'm starting to see that her stepfather said, because he'd read about the protest and had the same reaction as just about everybody else in town. She watched him work and began to ask questions about which bullets splintered upon impact and which ones mushroomed and the difference between rifles with wood versus synthetic stocks. She wanted to know whether people needed a special permit to buy guns in Wyoming. No, he said. She asked if Wyoming had specific limits on semi-automatic weapons or magazine sizes. No. So there really aren't that many regulations she asked, and her stepfather stopped handling ammunition shells and looked at her. I don't need a bunch of rules to tell me this is serious stuff, he said. He picked up a tub of gunpowder and held it toward her. I mean, this right here is like having a bomb in the basement. <laughs> so take me seriously. Hmm, you have a bomb in your basement. Mariah took a step backward. Gun safety he said, is about being able to handle your own business. I know, and I agree, it is. It's just that so many people can't. Like with hunting, he says. Now, here's one of our, 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 our 
reasonable gun owners, right, our responsible gun owners. I'm not a fan of taking the horns and leaving the meat or just wounding an animal. There might not be a rule against it, but in my opinion, it's the wrong thing to do. I want a clean shot. I want to eat all of it. It's about taking personal responsibility. Eh, sort of a mishmash of messages, but I think I get where you're coming out. So she goes on. She talks to her mom, Tracy, and has to pose the question, though, first to her stepdad. What if a person isn't responsible? Well, he started to put away his gunpowder, meticulously arranging it on the shelves, and Mariah went upstairs to see her mother because I guess he doesn't answer. What if a person's not responsible? I don't have a speech for that. So upstairs she goes to see her mom. Tracy had taken women's gun safety classes, studied self-defense, and become a good target shooter. She was a natural athlete built by CrossFit and hiking, and she had killed her first deer while pregnant, she was, not the deer, and managed still to haul it out of a plowed field. A few months later, in the delivery room, she saw Alan, or she and Alan, the dad, saw the Columbine High School shooting unfold on TV and watched as SWAT teams waited outside throughout 40 minutes of gunfire before finally entering the school. Can't they do something faster, she had wondered then. I still have the same problem. Tracy had become an early education teacher at a local preschool where she and the staff underwent active shooter response training to prepare for whatever might come through their doors. They would act quickly to secure the children. They would barricade all entry points. They would sing songs to help the children stay calm. They would break a window to evacuate. And if none of that worked, they would create noises to distract the shooter and then rush out to tackle him. Sure. Each year when they reviewed their plan, Tracy felt increasingly certain that what she would really want in that nightmare scenario was something she couldn't have. Give me a gun, she told Mariah. Heck yeah, I'd want to shoot that sucker. I'd want to too, but could you, I guess is the real question. I can see that, but that's you. And not everybody is so responsible, Mariah said. Because, and this is what was important personally to me, because she had also read about several incidents when adults brought guns to school to protect students but endangered them instead. For instance, it's listed here, a teacher in California, and you know most of these stories, and I can tell you why you know them. A teacher in California who accidentally fired around into the ceiling during a presentation on gun safety, injuring three students. A school resource officer in Pennsylvania who left his gun in the locker room where it was found by a sixth grader. A teacher in Georgia who barricaded himself in a classroom and fired a bullet out the window. Not everyone can be trusted, Mariah said. We're safer with fewer guns, not more. I can see your point, Tracy said. Wow. And Mariah, now maybe it's just because it's her mother. I can see your point. And Mariah believed that if anyone in Wyoming was capable of changing views, it was her mother. She had recovered from a drug addiction early in life and become a Christian. Familiar story there, right? She had gone from being intolerant of homosexuality to embracing a relative who had come out as gay, and it usually takes a relative. When I talk to the school board, will you come? Mariah asked, and her mother said that she would. I want to hear what you have to say. Tracy said, I know there's some gray area, but you're up against people who see black and white. And of course she is. And she went ahead and made her appearance and got a minute or two to talk to the school board, at which she said, thank you for your time, trusted board members, an interesting way of starting. She smiled up at the 12 school administrators seated on an elevated platform and then began to read from the speech that was now shaking in her hands. I'm here to express my concern about arming teachers, she said. I believe allowing firearms in school is an irrational idea to introduce here. To her surprise, no one said anything, so she continued. She told the school board that she was worried about the mental health epidemic in Gillette, and that is outlined in the portion above that we didn't get to, but as you can imagine, a small sort of gas fracking outpost in the middle of Wyoming uh, with not much going on outside of that industry uh, has brought with it some... The, the conditions that sometimes lead to a, uh, well, like I said, a mental health epidemic and a rash of suicides. What happens when you have a mental health epidemic in an isolated rural town that's also overloaded with guns? Well, as it happens, 
uh, a lot of suicides. Anyway, she goes on to say that she said teachers were not trained for shootouts and that even armed security guards had failed to stop shootings, including the one in Parkland. And of course, she's absolutely right. Adding more guns to the situation, she said, will not be a universal solution. And now, her three minutes were almost up, she asked the board members to please consider and think deeply and search for new ways, and concluded by smiling and thanking them again. The chairwoman grabbed her microphone and told Mariah that she wanted to set her mind at ease. She said the district was looking into many ways to ensure her student safety, including bulletproof glass, door jamming devices, and possibly guns. We'll be back to talk more about it after this. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back once again to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We got uh, ran into uh, break time there, but just by way of winding things up, we uh, it's unclear, of course, uh, at this point, what the outcome of the school board's deliberations were. But I think the, the point I wanted to make, really, with it was uh, one, that uh, one lone teenager, and you really should read the article to get some sense of how she ended up as a lone actor in all this after starting off with a small, but in that uh, rural setting, relatively important group of school peers. But she ended up going on her own and convincing her mother at least to go along and uh, making a case that wasn't, well, here's the point. It wasn't roundly derided. Things weren't thrown at her. She hasn't been so far, at least according to the article, who knows what happened in the aftermath, subject to threats or intimidation. She made a simple, straightforward, and logical case. And really, I mean, it doesn't really matter sometimes making a logical case that even gun rights and especially responsible gun owners should support. Sometimes they don't support it anyway. But you know, she was able to make a case and, you know, responsible-ish sounding legislators, in this case, the school board, uh, couldn't very well simply shut her down and didn't take the opportunity to launch into a political tirade uh, since she hadn't done it. Now, that won't necessarily be the reaction you get from everyone, but just by way of encouragement, even if you are all alone in Gillette, Wyoming, you can get up, make your case and uh, make a case that's actually pretty difficult to logically refute and at least put the idea out there. And you might find, you might just find, and this is best case scenario, granted, that a lot of responsible gun owners say, you know what, that's true. And maybe we ought to slow down and think here, right? So at least the school board member has to say, well, there are a number of things we're thinking of. Bulletproof glass, door jamming devices, whatever that is locks, and possibly guns. It will be a long and careful process, this board member said. And then she moved on to the next speaker, who talked about incorporating technology into classrooms. So Mariah isn't quite sure, she says, whether they really got it or not. But the real point is that she was able to make that point, put that out there, and have people register the issues in their minds, and uh, hopefully they weigh things. It'll be very interesting to see whether the school board in Gillette, Wyoming, decides they can come up with the money for any of those other things, bulletproof glass, door jamming devices. And I, my fear, of course, is that they say, well, all of that is expensive, and just letting people bring the guns they already have is cheap. And, uh, well, you know what the issues are with all of that, including the costs that are incurred while waiting for that one day that you, even you, hope never actually arrives and how much risk is involved with carrying guns around 
anybody, but in particular squirming school kids several hours a day, almost every day between, let's say, September and June. And uh, the risks that in Curs are considerable, and uh, eventually you're going to start to have accidents, just like the one she's heard about. Plus, of course, it's sort of a a uh, a sub rosa endorsement, I guess, of, uh, of of the gun fail efforts. How come she's read about all these things? It's not I didn't do all the reporting. I know that's true, and it's not fair to claim credit for any of that. But how does the message get to somebody interested in standing up to basically all of Gillette, Wyoming, all by herself? Where do you get the information that putting guns in schools has costs, has consequences? With or without school shooters ever showing up, there are going to be problems. And there are going to be uh, any number of people in Gillette, Wyoming, or anywhere else who are going to say, that's crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about guns. And as a result, you don't, you know, you come to us with this stupid argument that there could be quote-unquote accidents, and then, of course, the lecture. Oh, there's no such thing as an accident, and there's only negligence. We'll be trained, so therefore there won't be negligence here. Well, I have some news for you. And that's the value of these anecdotes, not necessarily that they're data from which you can predict with certainty whether or not you'll have an accident in Gillette, but simply a counterpoint to the idea that if we train people and have them carry guns, they will not be negligent, which is not actually the case. And some people aren't responsible. Some people are responsible and still make mistakes and are negligent, even though they believe that they can train negligence out of themselves. And that's really the story. So uh, big uh, respect for Mariah and her mission there. And uh, a little pat on the back, I guess, to myself. For people like me and people like me who spread the gun fail stories, who turn them into more entertaining Twitter timelines like the well-regulated militia folks, the people who keep the online databases like the gun violence database dot org folks, the gun sense people who who uh, write those stories up in the trace, the people at Daily Coast who have taken up the the cause and uh, are writing on gun issues, chiefly the ones I tweet around and no longer have find that I have the time to write up uh, myself and post there. They've gotten tired of waiting for me to follow up with those stories and have taken it upon themselves to assign it to the regular daily staff, which is really the the, the best solution. Those, those guys who are on staff and uh, guys, I mean, generically, Without gender, but should get rid of that term, I guess. But that's a tough one to work out for me. But thanks to those who took that up and published those stories. And I would take a guess and say that through one of those channels, that's how compilations of stories of the type you would need to at least put the brakes briefly on the question of whether or not arming teachers is a good one, even in Gillette, Wyoming, I, I think that's where that information comes from. That's really chiefly, that, that was actually, once again, the chief motivation for me behind starting the whole thing uh, immediately in the aftermath of the uh, Sandy Hook shooting. That was uh, the immediate go-to response for almost everybody, NRA and otherwise, on the pro-gun side, and even some others, saying maybe it's not such a bad idea. Maybe we should have armed police officers in the schools. And it's a, that, you know, that's even a compromise that I can entertain, although it's definitely got problems, right? Uh, lots to consider in that, not the least of which is a, uh, not a, not a, a gun safety issue per se, but, uh, one of overall, uh, I don't know, how do you put this? I mean, it's not doesn't quite rise to the level of social justice per se. But remember, of course, uh, in particular in school systems with a significant minority population, the school officers, whether armed or not, but it only typically tends to get worse when they are armed because there's something, some extra level to go to. Um, and most officers these days are armed. And when you put them in schools, it is the students of color who most frequently find themselves the target of school officers' attentions, whether 
warranted or not from the outsider's view, like those of us observing what's going on. So it is problematic to place police officers and particularly armed police officers in some of these schools. Uh, But on balance, you hope that the guns don't come out for the wrong reason and that some measure of safety makes some sense. And in the meantime, but, you know, it's another one of the costs you got to figure in there, not just the guns floating around in teachers' hands, but the possibility that uh, intervention in disciplinary problems by police officers, uh, whether with their weapons, they they don't usually involve their, their deadly weapons in it, but they do sometimes involve the, uh, what, how, what do they say, what do they call it, uh, less lethal methodology on students where it's simply not warranted. And again, I guess the new layer of problem. Here's my, my prediction of the next level of problems, and I guess we'll find out maybe it's not a prediction, maybe it's already happened, once we get reports, final reports from the Santa Fe, Texas shooting. Uh, but yeah, we, we're really going to have to have a conversation about whether or not it is wise to respond to school shootings with officers armed with AR-15s. And I think at the moment, you will find that public opinion on the question, if there's a school shooting in progress, should officers respond with you know SWAT type gear and AR-15s? And I think most people will say yes, one, because they fear that the shooter will have an AR-15, and two, because it's already gotten into the heads of the officers responding to school shootings. We already know that this is the case from Parkland and other places, that when the officers, responding officers are, uh, I was going to say afraid, but when they believe, and, and they are in some cases just flat afraid, when they believe that the shooter has got an AR-15 and they don't, or even when they do, they tend to be hesitant about engaging because they are afraid that they'll be outgunned. And of course, I mean, well, unfortunately, one of the, you know, one of the things that comes with the territory is, yeah, but that's your job. And even if you are outgunned, you kind of have to stand and put up a fight here at some point. That's sort of what we expect of you. I mean, it's sad that we expect that of you uh, rather than, and and we'll continue to expect that of you rather than say, maybe we want to try and make sure that there is no or little or at least less opportunity for shooters to find themselves able to procure weapons of war and take them into schools. But that's, that's another fight that we're going to have to have. But yeah, it's a, I'm worried that the reflexive answer is going to become, yes, you absolutely respond to the reports of a school shooting with an AR-15 because, you know, what I expect happening uh, to happen eventually is, well, you know, we have the few officers who have responded and then refused to engage for whatever reason. And so now there's going to be this enormous pressure on officers to not be that guy and to respond and to charge in and to fire on the gunman. And Santa Fe tells us that you can have a 10, 15 minute running gun battle with somebody and still not hit them at all, which is worth remembering. Even if the school is now empty, it's still worth remembering. Uh, Worse, though, is that you have to consider what happens if the school's not empty. And again, you will miss occasionally when you fire at the suspect and you got to start thinking. I mean, I thought that was it's I'm surprised that we haven't had this discussion because I thought it was the responsibility of every responsible gun owner, every trained responsible gun owner like police to be thinking at all times about what's beyond your target, what's the backstop, what happens with rounds that miss. And I know there are certain circumstances under which you need to act even though you know that there's some danger posed to those in the background or those who are bystanders. But there are steps that you can take that would, one, still mitigate the situation. I mean, you know, we're afraid that police will be outgunned by the guy with the AR-15. Yes. But the guy with the AR-15, I mean, if he's hit by a 38 caliber round, a 45 caliber, a 22 caliber, if you're hit by a bullet, something happens, right? The situation changes. Sometimes it 
kills you. Sometimes it wounds you terribly. Sometimes it's not that bad, whatever, but, or sometimes it just gets things to stop for whatever reason, whether that person then turns the gun on themselves or not, uh, you know, or surrenders or runs out of ammo. I don't know any of the, no, any of the millions of things that could happen in a situation like that. If you, I mean, I don't know what the complaint is. I'm outgunned. Yes. But if I get a shot off and I hit the suspect with my pistol sidearm, doesn't that, you know, is that not a good thing? And I guess, you know, considering the damage that can be done now, you want to hit him with an AR-15 round. I guess that ends things pretty quickly. That's true. But what, again, just what if you miss? Maybe on balance, the better thing to do is not to respond with the AR-15. What if I'm outgunned? I mean, that's a, it feels like a reflexively sensible argument. You want, you don't want police, listen, just say it to yourself. The rhetoric alone will convince you. I don't want the police to be outgunned. But, you know, what does it even mean necessarily to be outgunned? It doesn't really, does it really, do we really think that that's necessary as a response to say, well, I don't want the police to just wound the guy and arrest him. I don't even want the police to just hit the guy in the head and kill him instantly. I want him to be blown into a million pieces. I want his arm shot off of his body. I want the police to be able to rain bullets down on this guy like, you know, an Apache gunship. Well, are you sure you want that? Why do we need that? Really? Wouldn't one do the trick? Now, if you were really super well trained, one probably would do the trick. But I mean, I guess what we're saying is, well, you you know, you don't know exactly how things are going to go, even with training. I know I keep saying that over and over again. So we need to fire, you know, 17,000 rounds at the guy and blow him to smithereens so that there's no doubt. Meanwhile, in all the things where almost all the instances where police arrive and shoot back lately, they've ended up taking the shooter if not unharmed, then at least alive to stand trial. It's very rare that they actually, the police actually shoot the guy down and end up with a dead suspect. But it does happen. I mean, it's not, I guess I shouldn't say rare, but it's just a very odd idea that police need to go from, well, I don't want them to be outgunned, that is to say, too afraid to go in there and do something, to move from that to, and I also want the, you know, the guy to be evaporated in a bloody spray, right? That's, that doesn't really make that much difference. How, how uh, you know, how dead do you need the guy to be? And if you are, you know, improving the chances of surviving the crossfire for everybody else, then, you know, why not adopt a pr- more proportional response just as a safety measure for the other kids? But it's very interesting the way people come to think of these things. They are so motivated by the the need to reassert dominance and then exact some revenge on the gunman. And I can understand the emotion. But, you know, if we're going to plan a response, why not plan a reasonable one rather than why would you plan a massacre? I can't think of a good reason to do that. All right. Well, let's round up with some other things. This isn't where I intended to land on the show. Lots of interesting comments and some other stories that we have to get there. Uh, Warlock disagrees and says, yes, the officers should have AR-15s. And I don't know that they shouldn't come without any available, but I don't think it should be the standard equipment with which officers enter the school necessarily. And uh, I think maybe uh, I like the idea of here's where the AR-15 is helpful. It is... Um, easier to get a better bead on your suspect and aim and take one out with a rifle than a pistol by far. And, but, you know, I think maybe that there are other choices that could help with the targeting, but that don't necessarily have the destructive power of the AR-15. If you want, I mean, essentially you should be entering in the hopes of what you're asking for is a surgical strike. Yes. One shooter in a large building, possibly filled with thousands of other potential targets. You're looking for a surgical strike. You'll need a more surgical weapon than a pistol. Yes. But then a targeting, you know, target shooting rifle would probably do the trick. And is there not something that either exists on the market or could be developed 
that has the targeting precision but doesn't necessarily carry the same muzzle velocity and destructive power in the rounds. Certainly there's something out there that could offer a different response option. Not to mention that I also have a, a fairly significant number of stories of officers responding to shooter scenes that either turned out to be false alarms or were under control by the time the officers arrived, but who then nonetheless accidentally fired those AR-15s during their response because they're kind of clumsy weapons. Yes, the officers need to take the guy out, Warlock, and I'll let's put it this way. I'll fire at you point blank with an AR-15 or point blank with a 38 revolver, and you tell me which one of them makes you less dead. And I'll use that one. And then we'll also we'll run the same experiment, and after you're dead, you can tell me whether you feel more dead, having been blown to smithereens or just having been shot. You know, I mean, the officers need to take the guy out. And the answer is, I mean, there's several ways to take out the shooter. Tomahawk missile would be a, an excellent one. Uh, predator drone could do it. But you don't take those to school shootings. And there are good reasons. And uh, we have to ask whether the question scales. Is the AR-15 an appropriate school shooting response weapon? It's an excellent urban warfare response weapon. If MS-13 is invading, yes, the answer is to use the best weapon, and I'm suggesting that the AR-15 isn't it, because it's troublesome, it's overly destructive, and it's clumsy as well, and I, and I think we think that it's a gun, and officers are trained to use guns, so let's hand them out like candy to people who may or may not be trained with those rifles. They run into this problem a lot in the military, too. They train those guys to use, of course, actual military rifles. And then everybody sort of thinks, well, shouldn't those be the kinds of people who we trust at home with pistols? And shouldn't they be able to keep them in their on-base housing? Or if they live off-base, there, too. And uh, the military runs into a lot of issues with this and has to issue all sorts of papers and training statements and training regimens. And a lot of times I find stories about it in gun fail, of course, where the base uh, brass have to implement a how to be a responsible pistol owner in your private life to people who are fully trained on very sophisticated weapon systems or just your basic automatic uh, military rifle. And the fact that you're trained on one of those doesn't mean you actually know what you're doing with a semi-automatic pistol in your pocket. And they very frequently find that they need to train those guys off duty because they're going home saying, I'm trained, and then accidentally shooting themselves in the hands, arm, feet, legs, etc. Handguns won't get the job, the job done due to protection. I'm not even sure what that means. But I promise you that a bullet in the head from my handgun will do it just as well as an AR-15. And that there are precision rifles that aren't AR-15s that will get the job done too and won't blow people to smithereens if you happen to miss. Close quarters, you know, school and office building warfare. Think about it. Is the AR-15 the weapon? If you can make an argument that it is, I've yet to hear it. So, okay, we'll uh, move on. And uh, one other thing that was suggested, just to circle back to the first story of the day about what to do or how to react and whether or not to perpetuate the stories that have sprung up about the 1,500 or so missing migrant children. Uh, there was the suggestion if I gotta I gotta scroll way back to see if I can find it here, uh, that uh, oh, was it in this. I can't see whether uh, where where oh here we are. Josie Duffy Rice, who of course uh, longtime listeners will remember, was a frequent guest on the show when she was affiliated with Daily Coast, and she put together a long uh, Twitter thread about the situation, some of which I agree with and some of which I don't. Let's read through that on our way out the door for today. She begins it this way. Now that we're all on Twitter because of this game, 
I am making a public service announcement. Please stop sharing, and that's going to be a tall order. Please stop sharing that story about 1,500 kids missing. And that's in all capitals, by the way. The outrage I've seen is a result of a total misinterpretation and could seriously threaten the children you want to save. Well, that does sound serious, and you'll want to give that some thought. Before I get into it, she says, I'll answer the question 99 million people will inevitably ask, and I'm already starting to find ways to disagree. I know this because I'm a lawyer. I work on criminal justice issues, sometimes including immigration, and four of my closest friends are immigration attorneys dealing with this exact thing. Now, this part I take to be true. There are two things going on. One, HHS doesn't know where 1,500 unaccompanied minors are. And two, we are separating parents and children at the border. But she says these are different. The kids in Situation 1, HHS, the 1,500 unaccompanied minors, were not separated from their parents at the border. They crossed the border uh, as aliens or arrived here without a parent. That's not really the point I wanted to make, though, though it is important. These kids were dealt with by ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. They were released into the care of people that almost always fit within one of these three categories. And here's where we already begin to have difficulty. It's almost always. Okay, well then tell me about them. If they can't tell you about them, then I don't know what to say. But almost always either immediate family, extended family, or three other people that the child has a pre-existing relationship with. If none of these categories apply, then the kids normally stay in a shelter. And we always have to worry about what's normal. After a number of children were trafficked in 2014, see, that did happen, but it was in the past, these restrictions got tighter. Did they work? Did they shut off the pipeline? We don't know. I add, but okay, so... Those kids are released, and then they are no longer ORR's responsibility or problem. And as she says in all caps, this is a good thing. And normally, I would agree. One analogy I heard from my dear friend, who I won't tag without her permission, is that ORR is basically a jailer. Do you want the jail keeping track of where every former inmate is? Now, I have more to say about that, but before we do that, let's talk about the word missing. Because basically, by all accounts, HHS did a cursory reach out to check on these kids and couldn't find out where they were exactly. And this much we do know. And they didn't really do a great deal to try to locate them. And basically, they said what they were essentially saying was up to 1,500 guardians to whom we assigned these kids didn't answer our telephone calls. Well, they might not be missing. They were at home watching cartoons. They just didn't answer the phone. Okay, then we've overstated the number. I can agree. I can understand that. When I say cursory, Josie says, I mean cursory. We're talking about phone calls, like no door knocks, no checking school records. They called and they didn't get answers. So there are so many reasons why people wouldn't answer. And we did note some of those on Friday. Maybe those kids are living with someone undocumented or maybe they aren't, but their sponsor is legitimately completely scared of immigration authorities in Trump's America. Certainly a possibility. They aren't missing, she goes on to say. They're almost certainly, well, we don't know that. They are almost certainly, maybe, living with family members who almost certainly don't want to interact with the government. That's probably true. And we shouldn't ask them to. ORR's job is not to track and monitor these kids, and it shouldn't be. As my friend said, if there were an issue, abuse or other wrongdoing, it should go through the proper agency, children's services, or what have you. It shouldn't go through HHS, ORR, or DHS, or ICE. And I suppose I would rather that that not reside with them too. But I think one of the issues that we're facing here is that there's no mechanism for that handoff. And nobody inside HHS or any other federal agency that particularly cares to make consistent contact with the local authorities who should be doing this tracking and that by itself is problematic. She goes on, though, when your school loans provider can't reach you, are you missing? No. When your boss can't find you on a Friday night, are you missing? No, they aren't missing. Some unanswered phone calls does not a missing child make. Now, I started out identifying two things that were happening. The second, the separation of children and their parents at the border is, as she says, goddamn unconscionable and sickening. But do not confuse the two. The potential for it backfiring is real. 
that I'd have to hear some more about. What we're doing, demanding is that what we're demanding is that ORR, which works hand in hand with ICE, keep better track of kids they basically would like to deport if given the chance. We don't want that, and we do not want that. That's true. I'm not going to get the chance to finish up the very long thread I recommended to you. I'll show you uh, the way to find it, of course. But yeah, I guess here I would say, well, now hold on a second. Where the thing seems to me to get off course is when Josie tells you what we're saying, because we are not all saying that. But of course, that's the way you have to conduct things on Twitter. You have to assume somebody says something and respond to it. And if we've got more to say, well, then by all means, we can say it. And I'm sure Josie's got reasons for that, too. But I don't know that we're all saying that we want the federal government to track, but we certainly do want the federal government to have a plan in place if they're going to start seizing children at the border for the safe and reliable and understandable and trackable, to some extent, in the civilian sense, handoff of kids to local authorities who actually know how to take care of them, not shrugging and walking From away. From Daily Coast Radio, on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the k in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Do stay tuned because there's a special edition of the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy coming up for our Monday Memorial Day. Joan Walsh hammered Ben Ferguson with some truth, says Justice, and it was delicious. And he'll serve it up to you next along with other fantastic stories like the Ireland landslide vote to repeal their Eighth Amendment.